I have two sets of papers. I uh, preached at a place er uh, really early in the year, and when I got there, none of my technology worked, and I hadn't printed off the sermon, so I had to speak off the top of my head, so um, I've brought uh, multiple ways of doing it just in case. Um, at 9.30 on, our, on Saturday mornings, uh, we have Saturday discussion classes, and for me, that's probably the best, uh, most exciting time of the week, is having a discussion with um, 15 to 20 other people. Um, I always hear lots more wisdom. Um, I hear God speaking through people, and we, we just look at the Bible. And so I encourage you to come along at 9.30. And also what is good about that is I don't have to do all the speaking by myself. And so uh, today is not as comfortable as I would like it to be. Uh, when my dad was at school, he used to play rugby. Um, but early on in his rugby career, um, he found out that he had to wear glasses. And so he had to give up his rugby career. So dad then took up a lot of racket sports. And so he played tennis, he played table tennis, squash, badminton. And so uh, that's kind of what our household did. We were a racket sport family. Not so long ago, my dad uh, turned 71. And uh, I remember him telling me that when he was a 30-year-old squash player uh, in Rotorua, there was a young girl of the age of 15 that would always play against him and the other top men of the club. And there was a reason for that, and the reason was that she was so good for her age that no one at her age could play at her level, and she had to play the older men in the club. And I spoke to Dad last week, and he, and he remembers saying to her, if you keep practicing, one day you'll be really good. And as it turns out, she became world number one. And you probably guess her name if you're old enough, and that was uh, Susan DeVoy. All my life, on and off, I've played racket sports. I've actually had very little interest in rugby. We never watched it, we never played to it, we never went to a game. And so I might be the only Kiwi in New Zealand that doesn't really care whether we win or lose the rugby. It's just got no interest to me. But as a young boy, I got to play badminton, and that was the earliest sport that I can remember playing. Did you know that a shuttle uh, is the fastest um, hardware in sport um, throughout the world? It goes or can go at 493 kilometers per hour. That's what the fastest badminton smash is recorded at, 493 kilometers. Now, I wish that was my smash, but sadly it's not. Um, but this can give you an idea as to how fast the sport is. I remember Dad coming home quite often, and if you've ever played a racket sport, you'll have noticed over the years that they have changed considerably. So this is now a, uh, a graphite and carbon racket. But in the old days, if you remember playing a racket sport, they used to be wooden, and they used to have a, like a frame on them that would stop them from warping because the, the strings would kind of warp the wood. But I remember my dad coming home, and because he had such a powerful smash, um, the racket couldn't withstand it, and it would always break at the head here um, because he was so good. I've played a lot of team sports, and I've enjoyed them, but there is something special about having a good partner on a doubles badminton team. Um, quite a few years ago now, as I reached my peak, because I'm heading downhill now, but uh, I was fortunate enough to play on an A-grade team with A-grade players. And what I quickly realized was that I had never really thought about the impact my shot had for the person on my team. I'd never thought ahead. I could smash it, I could hit it hard, I could hit it soft and just drop it over the net, but I wasn't thinking two or three steps ahead as to how that impacted my partner. This level of playing was a level that I wasn't used to. It was a level where you thought just as much as you physically played. And the better I got to know my partner, the better I uh, knew what my partner was thinking, the better I knew the strengths and weaknesses that they had, the better I could set them up for a win and not a fail. The better I could place myself in the correct position uh, for their weaknesses as well as knowing their strengths. The better they could set up me if they knew the same. Forgiving my partner when they missed 
or hitting it outside of the court. Understanding that any point of the game, I could do exactly the same thing. The more A grade I played, the more 360 awareness I had. I had an awareness of the game, my surroundings, of the connection between my partner and myself, and what was happening on the court. The better we connected, the better we became at winning against stronger opposition that could have and should have beaten us. I'm gonna show you a video now to demonstrate, and I wish it was a video of me, but it's not. Um, but I want you to look at the players on the left-hand side of the screen. They're in a yellow and blue. And I want you to see how they magically seem to be able to get to the shuttle and be at the right place at the right time. I want you to see how they defend. They defend side by side. And then when they attack, how they atta uh, they're positioned from front to back. I want you to look at how they move around, making they're there, sure they're there for the shot and getting the best position for the next shot. They also seem to know at all times where their partner is and what they're doing. Even though they lose the point, their movement is what is important and connection is the key to playing well. So have a look at this video. <laughs> yeah, I wish it does. Thanks. Yes, I do wish it was me, but not at this age anymore. Um, you can see how they moved. They were just in sync. They were there for the other person. Now, I do still play badminton, and I do it on a Monday night in Papakura. And so last Monday night, I had a partner subbing in for one of my teammates, and he was really good. Actually, he was better than me. But he was kind. He was not judgmental. He was open to receiving advice and to getting it. Uh, there was a flow between us. You know, there was a connection. We covered each other's weak spots. Um, we even had some laughs with the opposing team. And even though we lost, which is generally what happens uh, when I play, um, the night was totally enjoyable. Um, I had a, a thoroughly enjoyable night. But last week was a different story. Again, we had another sub that played for our team, and that person was loud. They were criticizing and critical. They made fun of uh, other teammates on my team. They got upset and angry when either of us made a mistake. That wasn't such an enjoyable week to play. What happens when we don't communicate? What happens when we don't understand our partner? Well, we lose points. And if you add those points up, they become games. And these games, if you lose enough of them, mean that you go down a grade. But you can also do some other things on the court, and I've learned this by experience, you can break your racket. This is what happens when you don't communicate with your partner. This is what happens when you don't understand the other person on the court. This is what happens when you don't set someone else up for the win. And this is what happens when you want to do it your own way instead of what is best for the team. $300 later, you need a new racket. Now, that's okay if you can find, find the same model. Um, and when you're playing badminton, you don't want two different type of rackets because they two, do two different type of things. And so if you can't buy the same model, that means you have to buy a new model. And you always need a spare racket in case you break some strings. So not only is it just one racket you have to buy, $600 later you've got to buy two rackets. Not only does that make your bank balance unhappy, but it makes your wife unhappy too. Um, that you're spending so much money on sport. But I'd like you to hear this. Disconnection is a way to defeat. Disconnection is a way to bring defeat. And I'd like to think, leave you with the opposite rather than the negative, but connection brings victory. 
Let's say it together. Connection brings victory. Let's do it one more time. It wasn't quite loud enough. Connection brings victory. I want you to think on that. Now, you're asking yourself, what's this guy doing? He's preaching on badminton rather than on relationships. Um, but from my experience, uh, sport has everything to do with relationship. And in actual fact, playing sport has helped me be a better colleague, a better father, a better pastor, but more importantly, a better person in the partnership I have with my wife. And so I choose connection. I chose Karen to be my doubles partner for life. I chose her to play the game of life with me. So why wouldn't I choose to set her up to win? Why wouldn't I choose to be in the places that she cannot be? Why wouldn't I choose to be strong where she is weak? Why wouldn't I choose to encourage and affirm? Why wouldn't I choose to understand her needs and her wants? Why wouldn't I choose to lay my preferences down for her? Why wouldn't I choose that we fight the enemy together? Both utilizing the strengths that we each come with. And I choose to be a better version of myself for her. The game of life is very similar to playing sport. Understanding each other, communicating, knowing each other's weaknesses and strengths, being in the position that your partner cannot get to, looking two or three steps ahead uh, to help each other in the right direction and to help us fight the opposition, forgiving and forgetting when we make a mistake, learning from the past games, planning for the future games, and playing well in the present games. So one of the key ways we can start to understand this is through the five love languages. And if you've never heard the five love languages, then you need to get some paper out, you need to get your phone out, take a picture of the words. Uh, you need to remember these so that you can be a better person for your uh, partner. So here are the five love languages. Firstly, they are gifts, touch, acts of service, words of affirmation, and quality time. Do you know each of these love languages for your kids? Do you know what their top ones are? What about your work colleagues, or your church friends, or your teammates, or the community that you come in contact with? Knowing their love languages helps you interact with them on a greater way. More importantly, we need to do this and know this from our partners. What if we took the time to understand each other's love languages? We would be able to interact with them in a way that shows we really care. Sometimes I think my wife has all five love languages, which makes my life very busy. <laughs> Lucky me. But let's say her love language is gifts, okay? And in the past I have learned from the, uh, this, um, I haven't always purchased it from her point of view. And so when I purchase her a vacuum, a boat or a motocross bike, it isn't always a winning scenario because it is what I'm really wanting rather than what she's wanting. We may not do this from that extreme. You may not be as stupid as me. But uh, we do, do we spend the time to really know what someone needs? How that love language is received from their point of view. Not having our own bias on it, uh, on what we think it should be, but purely on what they think it should be. And so this is how it really does kind of work in our house. So Karen, one of Karen's uh, love languages is acts of service. And so uh, if I get a warrant for the car and then I fill up the car for her and bring it back home, um, that makes her happy. And now uh, my, uh, one of my two love languages is words of affirmation. And so if Karen says to me, thank you so much, darling, for doing that for me, and it makes me feel safe now, and then she says, I appreciate the time you took out of your day to fill up my car, Karen is happy, and uh, because she gets her acts of service filled, and then I feel like I've made her happy, and so I feel good. She's affirmed me and affirmed my gift. 
Now, it goes one step further that if Karen gives me a kiss on the cheek, because my love language is also touch, then I'll go wash the house, mow the lawns, wash the car, <laughs> clean the windows, and come back for a few more of those. Yeah? Yeah. So we've heard about the five love languages. But we don't have often talk about what makes them work and what doesn't make them work. And I want us to give a voice to perceptions and expectations. These are good or bad, depending on whether they are in, unsaid or whether they are said. And I'm gonna give you another example from my um, terrible history and experience. And so Karen's family um, have all been brought up that a car is just to get you from A to B. Heaven forbid. It doesn't have to be fast, it doesn't have to be flash, it doesn't have to be big, and it doesn't have to be expensive, but it has to be cheap to run, okay? Uh, Newson family cars, uh, the opposite. Um, they have to look flash and have mag wheels. That's an important thing. It has to be fast, it has to be powerful, um, it has to be big and be able to tow lots of things. And generally, it's more expensive and costlier to run. So, now I get married to Karen, and Karen, of all cars, has a 1985 Honda City. Now, if you know what a 1985 Honda City is like, it's like a big roller skate. It's, it's, it's small, it's tiny. And I come along with a V8 Bedford van towing a boat, okay? Real life story. Karen hates my car. It's big, it's ugly, it's cumbersome, and it's expensive to run. I hate her car because it's small and you can't do anything practical with it, like tow a boat or take lots of people anywhere. So, we go buy a new car. Then we get upset with each other because we don't understand why. We don't understand why each of us wants a different car. It doesn't make sense to us, either of us, as to why we think the particular way that we think. What is the reason for this? It's because we come from different backgrounds and we have different expectations and perceptions about what a car should do and what it should be like. If left, this can cause a division between us. And possibly for a while, we had a few heated discussions. But until we talked frankly about why we felt that way, until we understood each of us and where we've come from, and until she saw that I was right all along, no, just kidding about that, yeah. Um, until I saw it from her viewpoint, I could never be happy. And with the choice that she make, I would never be happy with that. So it's not to say we didn't buy a car that neither of us liked. But until we talked, each of us didn't realize what was important to the other person. We were opposing players on the same team. When we said what our expectations and perceptions were out aloud, when we gave a voice to it, when we understood each other's five love languages, when we started to connect and get to know what the other person was like, what the other person wanted, what the other person valued, when we knew how they did things and what they thought about things, it became much easier. We weren't opposing players on the same team until I took the time to understand from her point of view, not just my own. When we did dialogue about it all, we started playing as a partnership and as a team rather than opposing players against each other. And I think Jesus said something about this in the Bible. And so we're gonna have up on the screens now um, two verses from John 15, uh, verse 12, I think we are. If not, go to John 15, verse 12 and 13 in your Bibles. And I think Jesus talks about this a little bit. And he says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. What if laying down your life didn't just mean it in a physical sense? But what if it means sometimes laying down our preferences, our likes, our thoughts of what we think pleases others? What if laying down our life meant that we were really to hear and understand others, to hear and understand people's expectations, to hear and understand people's perceptions, 
and to hear and understand people's love languages? What if we joined together not as opposing players on the same team, but we chose to be defenders side by side? What if we choose each other to move forward on a united front when needed? What if we choose each other and set each person up to win rather than to fail? What if we choose to be vulnerable so that we can let people that have the strength be in the place that we can't? What if we choose to be the strength when others have a spot of weakness? What if we choose to lay down our preferences so that we can help others feel loved? I have got a little video now and I think it explains it the best and challenges us the most. So let's see this. I don't know what to say, really. Three minutes to the biggest battle of our professional lives. All comes down to today. going to choose to mend the racket or put it away and get a new one our relationships are the biggest battle of our lives either we heal as a church or we are going to crumble some of us are in hell right now and if we stay there and get the kick, uh, crap kicked out of us we can do that or we can fight our way back into the light. One inch, one conversation at a time. The inches, the people we need are everywhere around us. And either we heal as a church now, or we will die as individuals. Choose to play the game together choose to play well choose to play as a team as a united front in whatever game that life throws at you I leave you with the question Papster what are we going to do let's bow our heads dear Lord you've given us a choice today do we choose to play on the same team do we let you be our coach and to guide us? Do we build our relationships to make them stronger? We just ask that your spirit come upon us today and give us the direction 
Help us with forgiving. Help us to have conversations that will just grow our relationships that we have with each other. I pray today for this church, that this community here will come together and be in a, a team that will win the battle. I thank you for all the blessing that you give in your name. Amen. Everything changed when you called it